October focus. It's building the body of Christ. And it came strongly to, to my heart to, to bring this message here about the generosity of God. And the generosity of God is not is not little. It's not just a little. It's an extravagant uh, generosity. So I want to talk about that this morning. And when we talk like a title like this to the church, maybe some of you are already thinking, "Oh no, it's going to talk about money." And then so so be be um, be uh, calm this morning. I'm not going to uh, raise funds for for anything. I just want to marvel at the generosity of God and learn some lessons from it this morning. Go to the slide uh, number two. And uh, actually, the last song we did not sing, but we should sing it at the end. I was so happy to see it in the, in the lineup, because the last song is exactly the same as this verse here. And we will sing it at, at the end, okay? Uh, praise the Lord. We, have, uh, we are relaxed today. We don't have uh, to rush to another second service, so we'll have time to take a little uh, singing at the end of the service. But we need to marvel at the uh, generosity of God. And the first place to start uh, marveling at God will be to look at the wonderful uh, generosity of God, the, the lavishness of God, and, uh, and the beauty of, of nature. The heavens proclaim the glory of God day after day. All the, the, the stars and the, the beautiful sceneries that comes with it. Day after day, they continue to speak. And that's the, the point I want to, to bring to you this morning. The heavens, the stars, the moons, the st you know, everything, and the beauty of nature speaks. It speaks without a sound. And it speaks without a word. Don't need to. Everybody will hear this message, yet their message has gone throughout the earth all, all to all the world. And in verse 2 it says, this message, the, the beauty of the, the skies and everything, they make him known. So you look at the beautiful nature and you discover and you marvel at the beautiful God who created that so, so wonderfully. Is, is that true? Yes, uh, we, we need to, to be reminded of that. You know, I love to, uh, sometimes I hop in a taxi from Fanning, I go to the Fanning Reservoir, where you uh, do some hiking in nature, and when you get off, and then you, you find yourself in the beautiful nature, and you hear the birds singing, is, it's awesome, the, the peace that you have and everything, and the variety that you see in nature. Go to the slide number three. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 for ever since the world was created people have seen the earth and the sky through everything God made they can clearly they can clearly see his invisible qualities you look at the beautiful nature you find the qualities of God such a wonderful God. Hallelujah. Such a wonderful God. You see His power. You see His divine nature. You understand uh, how He wanted to bless the creation or, or us uh, as human beings. In fact, you begin to get a sense of the character of God when you look at everything that God has woven. Uh, when he has woven his generosity into our existence. And, and it's, it's really wonderful. Whether you believe in God or not, it's still true. God has woven his generosity and the way that he created the world for the unsaved people as well. They enjoy it as much. They can go hiking as well. They can go fishing as well. They can go camping. They can do anything. They can enjoy nature as much as the Christian. So God is so generous that he does not limit his generosity. Um, and, and God has woven into the, the creation something I want to insist on that something delightful. You know, think about the taste. How many kind of food can you get today? Have you ever been uh, going on the countryside and as you are riding either in the car or whatever in the countryside, you see a pig in the mud? What do you think when you see the pig in the mud? Do you think about the bacon? Do you think about the pork chop? 
but this, it is it is there you know a butcher looks at the pig says oh that part is really tasty <laughs> oh the loins you know and the filet mignon and, and all of these parts but in this dirty pig there's so much variety already uh, for you the taste the taste so we don't think like this, but God thought of this. But no, God thought to give us a variety of choice, a variety of style, a taste of our en enjoy for our enjoyment. Chinese food, Thai food, Italian food, Mexican food, Filipino food, African food. Wow, thank you, God. God has given to us uh, all the time. Can you say thank you, God, for that? When God gave life to the universe, he spared nothing. Think about some of the incredible gifts. Beautiful sunsets. You like it? Beautiful yes. sunsets. Sister Luisa sometimes posts beautiful sunset out of her uh, nice place in the island. Mountain peaks, deep blue oceans. Think of the way plants give oxygen to you. A mother gives birth. And water gives life to every living thing. This is rich. This is mysteriously rich. This is lavish and this is awesome. When God does all of these things, in fact, every living thing in some way is a giving thing. God gives that to, to us, but every part of creation is also giving. The seed gives fruit. Water gives other things. Plants gives oxygen. Everything gives to fulfill more, give more fullness to this awesome creation. And our God is the one who invented all of this. Wow. Beauty, <coughs> smell, sound, touch. And you could go into so many, so many other details. God is, God's generosity is seen in the natural world. Think about the 25,000 kind of our kids. I've been to the Singapore uh, Botanical Garden. This is an awesome place to go. They have, I don't know how many variety of orchids. They have a section, it's all orchids. It's so beautiful. I don't know how many hundreds of pictures I took when I was there with, uh, when we visited our daughter. But did you know that uh, the orchid, even though you have 25,000 variety, are only one of 270,000 kinds of flowers, species of flowers. It's only one, but you, you, you can go everywhere. God does not do things halfway. He doesn't cut corners when he bless this creation. In our galaxy, in our, just like our solar system here, there are 100 million stars like the sun. Only in our galaxy. And there are 100,000 million other galaxies like ours. It's like... It's too big, I cannot even do the calculation for my mind. Someone described when they came to a beautiful hotel lobby and they saw the, the greatest, richest um, decoration of fresh flower arrangement. And it was so many since I've never seen that kind of things in the world. So wh what happens when you come into contact with such uh, something so beautiful and so abundant and so ex extremely extravagant. What, what, what do you do when you go to a place that's really richly decorated? You come and, and you wow in front of that. You stop and you look at it and you, you enjoy these kind of things and you can only admire the beauty and be amazed at such abundance. You know, abundance is also part of the generosity of God. Think about when you do your Thanksgiving dinner, or your Chinese New Year dinner, or a wedding banquet. Have you ever been to a wedding banquet and the married couple have served you a little sandwich only? <laughs> this is never seen before. There is a lavishness, there is you know, abundance, there is decorations, there is beauty and everything. And the joy of abundance should remind us of the generosity of God. It's not only beautiful, it's not only the variety, it's the abundance, the lavishness of God. Go to the next slide. 
Psalm 36, verse 7 and 8. How precious is your loving kindness, O God! The children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings, or they flee under, or they, they seek refuge. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness. These are the beautiful structures of gra English grammar, if you look at it. Abundantly satisfied. It's like words are, that are there are amplifying one another. Like, satisfy is already enough. But abundantly satisfied and with fullness of your house. The riches. And I was thinking, since it is our October focus, this is what the church is supposed to be like. A reflection of that. Because it says, in your house. In your house. And among God's people, there is so much fullness. There is so much gifts. There is so much resources. There is so much abundance and all the variety of your personality, of your gifts, of your talents to provide to the needs of, of outside ourselves. They are abundantly satisfied, the, 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 the children of man, with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. It's also pleasant. That is what God has given to us. And if you look at this, this section here, we will move into another dimension of the generosity of God. So far we've looked more into the, the creation of God, the, the, what God has provided, and how God has blessed us with so many pleasant things, like the taste and the beauty and the flowers and the sunsets and everything. But if you look at the uh, next verse, you will see another dimension of the generosity of God. Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is gracious love along with abundant redemptions. So God is awesome and His love. And His love also provides something, salvation, forgiveness, redemptions to, to all of us. And it is so important for us. Look at the next verse. Indeed you, Lord, are kind and forgiving, overflowing, with gracious love to everyone who calls in you. And again, you find this kind of expression so full, abounding, overflowing, you're so full and all of this. And it is in regard to your salvation and my salvation as well. So God not only create, that's why Paul in Romans says, oh, how deep or great are the God's riches, how impossible it is for us to understand uh, His ways. The way that God arranged creation, the way that God provides for the keeping of His, of his uh, creations and the delightfulness of people living as part of His creation, and also how He arranged redemption and salvation. This is too deep for mortal man's. Uh, no architect, no engineers can come up with some sorts of even a little bit of thinking like that. Nobody can think about this. You know, God could have uh, created one type of food with one type of taste. Amen. Everything the same, like manna, yes, or something like that. Like, how boring. <laughs> that you go to the fourth floor, one kind of drink, one kind of food. Tomorrow, one kind of drink, one kind of food. You know, ten years later, one kind of food, one kind of drink. This, this is not... You know, what we, we like, how much we like, you know, abundance and choosing. You know, one of the greatest fun I think that you have when you go to the restaurant is looking at the menu. Yes. And, and I just, wow, what am I going to choose today? So God is, is a generous giver. God wants to give. He gives, James says, he gives generously to all. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So God the Father gave Jesus and the generosity of the Father is seen and sending his son Jesus. John chapter 3. Next slide. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We are so familiar with that verse but it's, it still remained the most beautiful extravagant message of all. Is that true? I mean, we never, we never, never get bored at this, at this message. Hallelujah. Oh, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn, but that the world might be saved through Him. So what makes the love of God also unique? 
is that his generosity is even offered to his enemies. Because he's sent not to condemn those who should be condemned. But instead, he sent us to save us. How wonderful is mercy, his forgiveness, and his reconciliation. God so loved the world. What is the verb of the Bible? The most important verb of the Bible. No. Ah, maybe not. Maybe yes, it's part of it. It's like give, give. Because love, love is like, oh, I feel good thought for you. I'm really thinking of you. I really like you. But I'm doing nothing. <laughs> to, to express this love is not really, uh, you know, so, so special. So giving is the act that express what love is. It's the, the act of giving, the, the gift of Jesus that made the love of God obvious, understandable, and uh, that we can comprehend. You know, remove Jesus of the equation completely. Somebody tells you God loves you. Oh yes, that's true. You already, we already seen in creation. God is love us. But when you add Jesus, it becomes really so much personal. He took away our sins. We were rebellious. We deserve judgment. We should go to hell. And we are not because of, of Jesus. So God didn't just sort of love. He didn't only love. He gave. He gave and he gave Jesus. Without the giving, you wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today. So the giving becomes very, very important. So how can we respond to God's extravagant generosity? First of all, we should be receiving it, the extravagant gift of Jesus. Because what we brought into the, this relationship with God is sin. And, what, and sin brought physical and spiritual death. But again, God come back with a plan and find a creative way to bring life again. Even though we brought into that in our relationship sin and death, God brings relationship again alive. He brings the, His Son Jesus. Go to the next slide, First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 9. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. And God showed His love for us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have life through him and that's another like we're getting closer and closer to to the point this morning god has shown his love we have seen it we can understand it we receive it by receiving his son that he sent but we have also received his love we have received his life that means that the nature this of this generous God, the lavish God, we receive His life and to us we have decided. A preacher said, generosity was birthed in my heart when I received Christ. The reason is that I have accepted the most extravagant gift that anyone can ever give you. All my sins were forgiven. So that generosity of God be began uh, the process of being manifested through me because I have received the life of God when I received Jesus. So you are generous. I am generous. Can you say that this morning? I am generous? I am generous. Yes, you are generous and you might not see yourself as generous. But if you have received Jesus, if you have received a new birth, you have received the, the gift of generosity because you have received the life of Jesus. Actually, God put generosity in you that we might have His life. So that's what it says. His life is also His generosity. You know when we are most like God? We're most like God when we give. When we give. Generosity is born in our heart when we receive Jesus. God wants everybody to be saved. But He's looking for people through whom He can channel is nature. If he wants to save people and reveal who he is to other people, he, he, he chooses, he's looking in the church, he's looking into us, he's looking to us to channel his resources of generosity to others. You know, there is a desire in each one of us here to practice generosity and to give. There is. But at the same time, there is fear. 
and some of us. Some of us have already overcome that fear because we have experienced giving and we have experienced the joy of giving and we have experienced the, the, the thrill, the excitement. We have seen God and the result of the giving. So it, it created something contagious. So we continue. But some of us, maybe in this room, have never given a tithe, have not yet been very generous on that side. So but here we, we learn that generosity has been deposited. So how can we move from fear into giving our tithes? How can we move from fear to give offering? How can we move out of that a bit of selfish fear that we, some of us have? We, we learn that. We learn that. I come from a culture of suspicious and jealousy in my place. From the, I, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I think uh, issue out a little bit of the Catholic uh, church background. You know, like not so much like a, a, a tithe, a concept of a tithe. You, people didn't give tithes. If the priest would go from house to house, sometimes they would give like a $20. That, that is the tithe for the year. Something like that. So that wasn't the... And, and if, e even in the Christian church, I remember when I was uh, growing up, if somebody is really blessed, then other people will be jealous. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a culture of uh, selfishness, fear, and uh, that, that cover this generosity and keep it from being uh, expressed in us. So how can we move from that into faith, into believing and, and living like God? God did not hesitate, oh, I don't know this one. I'm not going to bless that person so much because I don't know how that person will, will respond. No, God did not. He just bless everybody, even his enemies with the gifts of his son and the beauty of nature to the ungrateful and the sinner and the wicked as much. They can enjoy the sun, they can enjoy the rain, they can enjoy the harvest. So that is how, how God is. So we should move in faith. Are we afraid? that if we give we will be poorer or that we don't have enough look at the next slide second corinthian yeah look at that carefully and and be at peace and and receive it by faith because this is an awesome scriptures god is able to give you more, more than you need okay do you have what you need today did you have money to take the ntr did you have money to dress up this morning? Yes. Do you have a hairbrush? Yes. Oh, so you are rich. You have a hairbrush. Okay. And you have a mirror to look in it. So that's even better. So God is able to give you more than you need. Okay, that's not finished. So that you will always have all you need for yourself. So who, who has given you what you need for yourself? God. Has he given you enough? Ah, yes, okay. And look at the rest, the rest part. Okay, God gives you enough for your need. And actually he says he gives you more than you need. Okay, so that's enough plus more. And now he's giving you more than enough for every other good cause outside of your own personal need. Is that true? Yes, so we have to agree with that. As the scripture says, he gives generously to the needy, his kindness lasts forever. This I was, uh, 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 through my devotion, I, I came to one devotion, it's called uh, Generosity, and I was listening to a short video of Pastor Robert Morris, and he says after he was saved, he was very excited and he wanted other people to be saved. Is that what you want? Yes, okay, a few here, okay? And then, so he says, it, it, that, that's quite an extravagant guy uh, in this, when you listen to his teaching. He says he began distributing tracts with a $10 bill, $10 US bill attached to it because he wanted people to take the, the track and read it. So that's what he did. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm just repeating what he says. So he went to a restaurant and a waitress took the, 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 the track, of course there's a $10 bill in it. She read the track, she gave her life to Jesus, and she told him, and then I called my husband, and I read the track to him, and he got saved too. And he says, 
what do you mean you called your husband why why cannot you just see him she says my husband is in prison so he got when he came out of prison he says I had the joy of seeing both of them being baptized he says that is when generosity grew in me and giving started because I wanted to win more people to Christ one day he said that he was he had I don't know him probably he's a quite a, a well-to-do guy for some reason but he says that er, an earlier stage he used to prepare and that's a good habit for each one of us I was thinking I, I need to practice that uh, he, he had prepared $100 bills every time he would go to church he had $100 bills ready to give that's how he wanted to bless others so he would go to church the Lord would show him somebody that with a need, he would give $100 bill. He didn't have to look in his wallet, think about it. He had all these $100 bills in the pockets. He would just bring it and give it. So one day, there was this lady who was hearing a message about the giving. And she, had, she was a single mom. She had never given a tithe. That day, the whole, she had heard the message. Faith came in her heart. And she said, uh, I need to give. The Lord is speaking to my heart, so she, she was going to give $100, and the voice of the Holy Spirit came, says, give 120, not 100, but the tithe was 100, gives 120. So she, she gave it. At the end of the service, the pastor goes in the parking lot, sees this lady, hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, says, give her something. So he got, of course, he has his $100. So he's giving to give $100 to her because that's what he's practicing anyway. And then the voice of the Holy Spirit says, no, give her 120 but <laughs> <laughs> And the way that he talks in the video, he says, God, I don't give 120 You know that. I only give 100 So anyway, he, he gave to this lady 120 What do you think happened? Tears confirmation blessing to both the giver and the receiver isn't it so when you do this it will always bring a similar we get nothing done if you think about it I, I'm, I'm not the inventor of what I'm going to say I read it so I'm just transmitting it we get nothing done without giving every day you give time and effort to your employers you give words of affections to your relationships. You give food to your pets and money to the things you believe in. Is that, is that true so far? Yeah. yeah. Giving is always a choice. In the same area, if you choose not to give, what will happen? If you don't give your time and effort to your employer, if you don't give food to your pets, if you don't give words of affections and uh, to your relationship, all of these things will die, isn't it? Yes. So without giving, there is nothing that works. Is, we understand? Yes. So we are moving in the right direction. So why did God say, bring your tithe? Does God need your tithe? No. Go to the next verse. Does God need your tithe? Uh, next one. Or oh, maybe next, next, next. Yeah, this one. I will not take a bull from your house, God says, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hill. I know all the birds in the of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, of course, God will never be hung hungry in that sense. If, if, it's just to help us understand, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all of its fullness. So why is God asking a tithe of you? It's not for Him. It's for you. Get, get that straight. That, that's very, very important. Why is God asking you for your tithe? It's not for Him. It's for you, because it's going to do you good. Everything belongs to Him. It will work selfishness and greed out of your heart. And instead, work will 
work faith uh, and to your heart instead of selfishness. When a new sheep was born and the cattle in Israel, God asked the first one for himself. He did not say, wait until you have ten, or wait until you have an 100 or 1,000, then choose the weak one, the poor one, and give it to me. No, he says, I want the first one. Before everything else, the firstborn is, belongs to God. And the principle of giving is very simple. It's to put God first. And if we put God first in finance, we put God first in our lives. Yes? yes. Okay. Yes, but, Pastor, this is an Old Testament principle. Giving a tithe, isn't it? It's an Old Testament principle. But in Malachi, the Lord says clearly, I am the Lord, I do not change. So there's something that does not change with the Lord. And also, there are principles in the Old Testament that are continue in the New Testament. Example, do not commit adultery. Jesus said in Matthew, you have heard, you have heard, do not commit adultery. Where do you hear it from? The Old Testament. But Jesus says, let me add a little to it. This principle is still valid and let me explain to you a little bit more. Do not entertain lust because you also commit adultery. Another one, same thing. You have heard, do not commit murder. But based on that one from the Old Testament, I'm adding up to that. If you want another one, uh, Paul says and Jesus says in uh, different ways in other writers of the New Testament, if you want to fulfill the Old Testament law, it is summarized into two laws in the New Testament, which are? Of God and love your neighbor. And this summarizes this is the golden rules, all the Old Testament. So not all the rules of the Old Testament, the commandments of the Old Testament, are canceled because we are New Testament. They continue. Why? Why do they continue? Because they are a blessing to your life. So that's what happened when we, we read about this. Okay. So giving will do more to your heart than any actions will do. Because it is liberating. It is really liberating. Now let me tell you something to you who have not yet given a tithe yet. Uh, you are not a bad person. Okay? If you say, Pastor, I feel condemned now because I have, I, have not, I have not given a tithe. And I'm not asking you to raise your hands. It's not my business. I don't know who's giving how much. It's not my business. It's you and God. So I, I just want to, to bring a little encouragement to you. If you have not yet began tithing, you are not a bad person for that, and God does not love you less. So that's clear? Don't feel condemned. You may even sincerely love God and you have a desire to serve as anybody else who pays the tithe. It's just that in this area you have not learned the liberating pr principle, you have not l learned and experienced yet the, the benefits and how it would enrich your life if you would obey God. Amen? Amen. And also, we are all, if we, if we look at another aspect, we are all growing in different uh, areas of our life at different speed, and we are all struggling with different things. You might be struggling with the tithes. I might be struggling with another thing. Another one might be struggling with forgiving someone. Another one might be struggling with something else. So we, we struggle, but it, it, it means that as we learn to live by faith, we will grow into these areas, and finally we, it will break through, and then we will be doing what the Word of God says, and we will benefit for that. Okay, happy now? Okay, so if you are a Christian who, who thinks uh, in your mind, I would like to tithe, but I cannot afford to because I'm a single mom, because this, because that, I cannot uh, afford to. Okay, so how can you move into being able to trust God and to give your first tithe ever to the Lord uh, someday? So you have to realize something, you will never be able to afford tithing until you tithe. Okay? That's, that's a very simple principle. Until you try it, 
you will not know it. And uh, you need to know and believe what God says and begin thinking and being like God and generous. Turn to Malachi, the next verse. This is a very well known scripture. We are very uh, uh, known with that. The Lord all powerful says, Try this test. Bring one tenth of your things to me. Tithes means a tenth. Put them in the treasury. Bring food into my house. Because the principle of God is that the tithe goes to the treasury. It, it goes for the, the family of God, the households of God, for the ministries, for the outreach, for whatever it thinks. Test me. If you do these things, I will surely, look at what's come to you, what you're missing. I will surely bless you. Good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky or the windows that will open. Depend of the different Bible version. You will have more, again, the same expression we've seen many, many times this morning. You will have more than enough of everything. Okay. It doesn't mean you will become a millionaire. <laughs> it doesn't mean also if you give uh, $100 that you will get 1000 It doesn't mean that or even a 100 That's not what it means. We should not understand that. But you will receive something of different kind of natures of, that will come to you as being good things, okay? I want to share a little testimony of uh, something that happened to me before. But first, uh, click and look at the, the last part. There's another part to it. I will rebuke the devourer so that it will not destroy the crops of your land. So what was that? Devourer? What, what's, what's that devourer has to do with anything? Okay, God says in Malachi, the previous verse and this one, that you are cursed under a curse because you have robbed God with your tithes. So there's something, a curse is like an, uh, it's an absence of the blessing. You, you do not receive the full blessing of God because you are robbing God. So God withhold something on you. So now he says, try Try this test. Try it. You will see. And all these good things will come. Good things will come to you like rain falling from the sky. You will have more than enough. And God says, I will rebuke the devourer for you. What is the devourer? What it has to do with me? The devourer is what eat up and consumes your fruits, your crops, your salaries, your profit and gains, your savings, your your shopping money and your cash flow and the, everything that you could get out of your working hard. You, you get it, you receive your salaries, but you never move out of debts. You never really are free to, to do something, to invest, to prepare your retirement. You, you can never move, move forward. You're always stuck in a rut. In a, in a circle. And it seems that you cannot break through. The devourer Okay, if you don't give your money, I, I will use this expression, but later on I will contradict this. Uh, if you don't return, okay, to God what is due to God, you keep it for yourself, what are you going to do with that? You're going to spend it, eh? You spend it somewhere else. You will use it somewhere else. You don't, you don't use it for God. You will use it for someone. That's when the, the devourer comes. The devourer is whatever will use maybe some bad habits, some that you have, or some, some uh, uh, spending style that you have, or some passion for something, or some, some greed, or whatever it is that the devourer will use to keep you from enjoying what you should be enjoying in the first place. You understand that? There's a some, the, some principle that take it from you and keep you from enjoying it. Yes. yes. I look at your eyes and so, so many <laughs> expressions. Yeah, it says, what? I'm not sure I understand that. The devourer is all the things of this world that will keep you from being generous and obedient to God, walking by faith, and at the same time will take what you don't want to give and will waste it. And it will not ended up to be useful to you at the same time. That's what a devourer does. It devours. It takes it. You have a crop. Okay, let's say put it like a, a rice crop. The typhoon comes. 
no more crop. Okay? God says, I will uh, rebuke the devourer so that your rice, your, your next crop, is going to be harvested. You, you understand? It's, it's, that's an illustration like that. Okay, tithing is not really giving to God because sometimes we say, oh, oh God, look at how I'm so generous to you. I'm so good to you, God. Remember that. <laughs> I'm giving to you, God. Okay, so sometimes we have, you see, God, eh? you know, God now owes me something because I've been really, really good to you, God. Okay, that's not what happened. Tithing is not giving to God, it's returning to God. What belongs to him to begin with? Give you an example. Um, if Brother Palmer has a, his employer's car, and um, he sees that I have a, a need, I, I need a car for, for two weeks, and then he, he asks his employer, his employer says, okay, okay, lend your pastor the, the car for two weeks. Then two weeks later, my wife and I, Saturday night, we pray. What are we going to do with the car? Okay, we have to give it back. So the next day we go to his employer and we say, uh, Mr. Employer, tomorrow, uh, last night we were praying, my wife and I, and we decided that we are giving you the car. <laughs> the employer will look at us and say, what? Who are these people? I should have never lent them the car. They're crazy people. This, you are not giving me the car. You are returning the car. This is mine. <laughs> You see? So sometimes we approach the, the idea of the tithe like this. It's like, God, I'm, I pray last night and I will give my tithe to you. Okay? No, God, no, you're not giving anything. You're just returning a bit of what God has blessed you with. And God says many times in that message that He has given you more than enough for your needs and all of this. And enough to give to all, even to other cause. So that's, that's uh, wonderful. Wow, the time is finished. <laughs> okay, I finish with that point here. When you study the Bible, you will find three kind of giving. Tithes, offerings, and extravagant offering. Tithe is where you start. You will never go to the next level if you don't start there. Offering is like when you hear of a need, of a project, of something, you, want, you have something that says, I want to participate. I want to give uh, more than my tithe. You want to get it? It's the more than my tithe. Because the tithe is like, no deal about this. It's not 9%. It's not 7%. It's 10%. Okay? And this is a return to God. But I heard that there is a, a project to construct payatas. There's something. Or I know that sister so-and-so in Lighta is going to see a doctor, a private doctor for, for whatever it is. So I want to bless. So above the tithe, there's a little offering, or a big offering. But then sometimes, when you really are generous like God, because God has put His generosity in you, there are times when you will hear of something, and God will tell you something, and it is extravagant. It's not a little thing. It's a big thing. And it costs something, it's big. And we have people in Lighthouse who are practicing that, a few people. And it's not only exactly with money that we can be generous, but that aspect is in the area. Pastor Steve and Sister Mary Nolan are extravagant uh, giving. Many of our projects in the Philippines, they are existing because of Pastor Jennifer's family. They have given and they are giving extravagantly the summer English camp and many other things that is ongoing that you don't even know about they have the cars I don't want to I know they don't want to hear that but the cars are extremely generously extravagantly generous and with the money their homes they are hospitable they, they, they think they, they, they see ways to, to do that there are many people that are uh, like this and when you experience the joy, that, that kind of experience is very special because the people that will be on the receiving side, they recognize the hand of God in that. They will cry 
they will thank God, they will worship God, God will be glorified and it will become contagious because of what you experience and s realizing that God has used you to bring such a result, you will cry too. And you will be so much touched that it will become contagious, you will want to do it again. So it's not a pain, it's a joy. It's passing out, but, but it's, if it doesn't start at the tight, you will never experience one of the most exciting, extraordinary joy that Christian can have to be part of something bigger, a life-changing situation, helping with the education of a poor child, uh, restoring the land of someone, or giving to, to something extravagant, an operation of something, or whatever it is that you can give, because it's God that is speaking to us. Amen? Amen. So, remember God owes own everything. Amen. Amen. I just want to, to close and uh, saying this. Many here today, you wouldn't consider yourself generous. But I want also to encourage you because I don't want to put it only in money because generosity is not only in money as you know. You are a generous person because you are a new creation. You have received the most extravagant gift. Last Two weeks ago, you heard Pedro testifying and when he was in the hospital. You heard Keith testifying. And what was the generosity in that case? Christians, who've hospital visitation, the love, the comforting words, and the prayer offered. It touched both of them extremely. And they have seen a, a hand of God, the presence of God, like God loved them through people. That is also generosity. I'm thinking of Choco and Cherry and the awesome work they are doing with the, this. This is, this is unique. You, you don't find that kind of a, I, I know she doesn't want uh, that to be said, but uh, this is true. This kind of generosity, this is extraordinary. You, you, this is their own money that they use. This is their own time. They are being abused all the time by these parents. Crossroads started with uh, the in the bedroom and in the living room of a fam Australian family that to store things for the poor and it became this great life-changing organization that, that touch. Um, Sister Penina visit prisons and she helped people in trouble with courts. Uh, uh, May, she goes to the ladies at the Wu Oi and every Friday she, she helps them then to do something beautiful. So she's generous because she, she helped them to create some art that uh, beautify uh, their life and their time. Sister Lisa at Crossroads, she's 75, eight. eight. She's still working to make a difference. She should uh, just raise her hands on the patio and look at the mountain and the sunset. <laughs> but she, ha she has, Helen D is working how many years and no. So uh, all the Sunday school teachers, you are committed in this church here. Uh, those that you call cleaners, that we would like to call you with a more uh, noble terminology, the, the caretakers or the, the beautifiers of the church, and those who prepare food and uh, for the meet and greet and the potlucks and everything. This is, uh, oh, go to the previous uh, slide. There's a slide I want to show you. Just, uh, uh, just go, go before that one. Uh, be just before that one. Look at this one. Cooking. It's love made visible. I wanted to show that to you because this is important. This is generosity. Generosity is grace made visible. The love of God in you made visible through cooking, through uh, generosity. So next time we have a potluck, don't only go to park and shop, get $10 of uh, apples. Think, think of, of the generosity of God and uh, participate a bit more. Generosity is grace made visible. By faith, we discern what God wants to give and when he wants us to give it. And these gifts meet precise needs at just the right time. And the faith of both the giver and the receiver is increased and God is glorified. Amen? Amen. I hope this encourages you. Generosity is grace made visible. I have more scriptures, but let's stop him. Brother Stephen, would you please come and lead us in that uh, song that we didn't sing at the beginning? That song's about the, the, the beauty, the lavishness of God, the generosity of God is shown to us through the beauty of nature. Hallelujah. And then we will worship.
our wonderful creator, hallelujah, the creator of all this and provider of all this beauty, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Amen. Are you happy to be here today? Yes. Wow, God is so good. I saw some. Hallelujah. The heavens declare.